So quickly, just, um, just to introduce the panelists briefly, although I'm sure you recognize certainly at least two of them from the film that we have just seen. Um, uh, James obviously was the director of the film, if you saw his introduction. Um, Tom and Jess obviously um, in, in the film, very br brave whistleblowers and have continued the fight since then. And I'm also delighted to say that we have um, uh, William Binney here with us, um, another uh, whistleblower. It's a good illustrious stage. I'm proud to be a part of. Um, and uh, Bill actually also just won this year's um, Sam Adams uh, Award for Integrity and Intelligence. So congratulations for that and good to have you here as well. Um, so I just sort of, before we get into some of the larger topics um, discuss, uh, in, in a discussion here, I just wondered uh, maybe Jess, if you're able to just tell us how um, uh, John, who obviously uh, sadly is not able to be here, if there are any updates there and how he's doing. Um, I, I saw John recently and he's doing well and hopefully will be due for relief to either a halfway house or home confinement. Um, this February after having spent the last 22 months uh, in jail. Um, so the first thing I sort of wanted to discuss was you were saying at the beginning, James, that you, you sort of took this journey to sort of with the question of who has access to information, who has a right to various types of information. Um, how did your, did you progress in your thinking of that or did you find anything out whilst you were taking the journey to make this film? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I kind of set out to do this in a way that was sort of uh, personal, as you can tell uh, from, from the movie. I wanted to um, kind of see this from the inside of, of what, what was it like to be a whistleblower and what were the, the personal uh, costs of that. Um, so I, I felt like the the sort of political angle was was being covered a little bit in the press and so forth, but what we hadn't seen was was um, the great uh, personal cost that that these people who stand up um, to tell the truth about these systems of power um, the the cost they endure. Um, so uh, it, it wasn't necessarily surprising what I found. I think it was very disturbing and, and moving to me um, to, to see the bravery of these people, um, particularly being a dad myself, you know, um, being there to witness um, John Kiriakou leaving his family, leaving his young children behind, um, was, you know, really brought home to me in a visceral way and hopefully does in the film too. Um, the the kind of um, what it means to take someone's freedom away, I guess I would say, uh, the kind of price that that um, people are paying for um, speaking the truth. And I think the film sort of really shows the the crackdown by the U.S. government. Even if you um, the prosecution doesn't end up t uh, going forward, even if you don't end up in a court case, I mean your lives are lives are ruined in in so many ways, as you can see in the film. I'm just going back to sort of the, the access to information. Um, I think it's an interesting one, particularly from, t from Tom and Bill's perspective with the, with the um, surveillance systems and the ability to collect information that, that you blew the whistle on. And then of course, um, Edward Snowden's revelations in the time since then. And I really feel that, and I wanted to get your perspective on this and that, that we now have the ability to collect and analyze um, so well. And yet this, these systems are obviously as much as we're the, the US government, et cetera, is collecting everything. It doesn't seem to be able to use that in the correct manner. We have um, corporations that know more about us than we do if you look at companies like Google. Um, and yet our powers to, to understand ourselves, the information we're getting as the public, is, is uh, completely out of balance. And I just wondered how you see going forward, I mean, you, you gentlemen both took brave actions, but we didn't... Do, it didn't seem to improve because we then had to, you know, we then get into a situation with what, what Ed had to reveal. So do you see it getting better in the future? Is it just getting worse? What do you, who wants to go first? I'll try that one, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it, it is getting, in, in many ways, it's getting much worse. And everything, every new device coming out is a new form of uh, surveillance or a new aspect to surveillance. Uh, uh, but for, for the governments that, uh, succeed at defending us 
in spite of collecting all of this information. The real problem is, you see, even if you took the aggregate of all the countries combined to try to stop terrorism, for example, uh, they could probably assemble on the order of 20,000 and uh, but uh, if they were focusing on just the terrorist problem or prop, perhaps those who might be involved at uh, 200,000 or something like that, that would be a manageable problem. But they forced these people to look at 4 billion people. So they're taking in, in information on everybody on the planet. So that's about 4 billion if you think about phones and, e and email and, and computer use. So that's dividing the 20,000 into 4 billion is about 200,000 people that each analyst must look at. Well, they're doomed to failure. That's why Paris happens. That's why the Boston bombing happens. Because these people don't know what they're doing. I mean, they can't possibly address all this data. And that's why the White House issued the big data initiative soliciting uh, 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 industry to come up with algorithms that will go through big data to try to figure out what they've got so they could pass it to analysts to look at because the people can't do it. Um, and in spite of, uh, you know, all the efforts, every time something happens, uh, they use that to get more money to collect more data. They fail to understand what they're doing. They're making themselves totally dysfunctional. That's the bad part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think Ed had a great phrase on this, Ed Snowden, where he said, uh, if you're looking for a needle in the haystack, just because you make the haystack larger, that does not help you finding the needle at all. And I think that's sort of quite a good analogy. So um, is there any hope? How can it be changed? I mean, can the NSA be reformed? The eternal question. Well, I don't really think so. Um, <laughs> certainly resisting uh, any kind of reforms. Uh, even when I was hired in as a senior change leader with a number of others from the outside, uh, they certainly made, made it well known that they were not going to listen to us or implement any of the recommendations. They certainly resisted all efforts, even prior to 9-11, to, to change. And 9-11 then became the trigger event, because it was a systemic failure, but a trigger event to engage in mass surveillance, secretly at first, using the United States as, as the experiment, and then eventually exporting it overseas on an extraordinarily vast scale. Mass surveillance itself is simply symptomatic of what I now call an obsessive compulsive hoarding complex. They can't get enough data. They're absolutely obsessed with wanting to collect it all. And it actually fundamentally reminds me of a, of a secrecy regime in a police state that I actually used to listen in on during the 1980s flying an RC-135s, and that was the former East Germany. And the motto of the Stasi was to know everything. But the scale at which you now can collect, the scale at which you can store, the scale at which you can retrieve. And so what's fundamentally at stake is the sovereignty of who you are as human beings. And this is something that science fiction has warned about. This is something that, that uh, those even in the 1970s during uh, an earlier period in US history have warned. Wow. <laughs> interesting. That is really interesting. Wow. White noise interference. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Well, on that note, <laughs> there's our hope for the future. <laughs> yeah. The word that comes to mind, though, I mean, I, this is an extraordinarily personal account of the three of us, myself and Jesslyn and John Kiriakou, respectively. But if there's anything, if there's one word in German right now that I'm very present to, it's Widerstand. We must resist these kinds of intrusions upon our society. And the fundamental question we must answer to ourselves, we're just kind of canaries in the coal mine. You see the price that we paid. What kind of society do we really want? And how much will we give up to, quote, unquote, have the government protect our safety and secure our liberties? Something has to give, as I said, as said in the documentary. I wouldn't even be on this stage with any of you or here in front of you as the audience if I didn't think there was hope. And I'm going to continue for the rest of my life, stand on the arc of history and jump up and down on it, bending it toward justice, as Martin Luther King Jr. has said. All empires fall and, and end up in the dustbins of history. The problem we have here is that the control regimes, and let's, let's be very honest with ourselves, information is the currency of power, it's a way to control. 
All this stuff about terrorism is simply a kabuki dance and a cover. Ultimately, power will abuse the control systems and they will turn it on the people themselves. You don't need to collect everything to know anything. Um, you bring up with the sort of the... Sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, you just brought up there the concept of sort of terrorism, the, these concepts of terrorism, national security, etc., being thrown back by the government as basically excuses. And you, you have the phrase in uh, the film, they said 9-11 was a gift. Um, you mentioned just before Paris. Uh, that's actually what I thought when I saw the recent, uh, the Charlie Hebdo killings in Paris, is this is exactly what they're looking for, as you see all of the world leaders, Western. I mean, they're leaping in there with their press freedoms, etc. I mean, it's it's... To me, this is exactly what I thought, um, that this is another gift for them. Is that how you view that as well? We're now... Uh, yeah, abso absolutely. I mean, the, the point is, uh, they're not really doing this for terrorism. They're doing it for population control and law enforcement. Those are the real users of this data. It's not, it's not that because they can't find the terrorists, but if, if they're looking at you and they want to get rid of you for some reason, they have accumulated all the data to retroactively analyze and figure out how to do it. I mean, they're using this for uh, the Special Operations Division of the, Depart uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the FBI are using this data uh, to find criminals. And so they're going through this massive amount of data looking for anything that would be uh, indicative of criminality. And then they're using it in courtrooms to prosecute people. I mean, we had this discussion with the President's uh, Civil Liberties Oversight Board, and they promised, they assured us, that the administration would now be telling people that if the NSA data was being used against them in court, that they would be told so they have the right to challenge discovery in a court of law. That's part of their rights as a citizen. Uh, well, and in fact, nobody has been told. In fact, the Solicitor General of the United States lied to the Supreme Court to get Amnesty International thrown out of the Supreme Court case, as a case. That was Amnesty International versus Clapper. Uh, they, <clears throat> the Solicitor General assured the Supreme Court that the people would be told that if NSA data was being used in a court of law against them, that the, the defendants would be informed so they could challenge it. And that's never happened. Uh, and so, uh, but they got that, but I still have one really good hope here. And it's uh, Jewel versus NSA. That's uh, Tom and I both have signed uh, sworn affidavits uh, supporting the Jewel versus NSA lawsuit, which is challenging the constitutionality in our in our country, that's the way to go at them because this is unconstitutional. This bulk acquisition of data. So we have we have very simply challenged the constitutionality of this as and supported that lawsuit. That's the one hope because that if that gets to the Supreme Court and it gets ruled properly, that is num and we're trying to educate judges to educate other judges who will educate the Supreme Court so that they'll know and have some idea when they pass a ruling on this technology that's being used, that they'll have some idea what it really means and what the impact will be. I mean, because they don't understand either. I mean, we have a real hard time getting our congressional people to understand, which, by the way, I might add, I was supposed to brief the Am uh, Amos uh, Conyers group, uh, who, was, uh, who were getting together to unfund NSA uh, a year ago in June, uh, or no, it was 2013, right after, the, right after the Snowden material came out. So July, I was supposed to go down and brief them so that they would have an, a better understanding of what they were going to vote for and how that this, uh, this impacts not just U.S. citizens but everybody in the world. Um, and, uh, of course, that, was never, that never happened because once they published the date and time, somebody called a meeting of all the uh, uh, Democratic members of the House at, ex at exact time. That was the president. And so that terminated that, that meeting. So they voted without uh, getting briefed on what was really going on. But the, even then, they only lost by 12 votes. So that's not bad out of 435. You know, that's not really bad at a first try. Now they're struggling to try to get something fixed, and they, they're really bumbling along and stumbling, and it's not really effective. Uh, Tom and I and some of the other whistleblowers submitted, and it's in the public record, um, and we sent to the EU, as well as all the members of Congress, all the suggestions, 21 of them, as to how to fix NSA. Uh, but uh, the president only picked one of them, I think, the two-hop principle, and uh, he failed to understand uh, what the, that there had to be limitations on that, because, for example, if I, as my first top, go to Google and do a Google query, how many other people in the world use Google? A couple of billion, maybe? 
Well, one of them is probably a terrorist, so we're all now suspects. At the two-hop principle, we can all be carried now and looked at by NSA. That's why NSA supported that, okay? That was the first clue that something was wrong. They supported the law. So, I mean, by using Google and Yahoo and any other company or even government agencies, you basically have two hops between any two people in the world. So that meant the entire world was legitimately a target for NSA, that law. So that's why we opposed it with Marcy uh, uh, Wheeler and many others, and it didn't get passed. But there's still some hope. And it is the court, because if that Jewel versus NSA gets ruled unconstitutional, their whole house of cards falls. And that's really what it is. They've, these people of, of very low or limited ca character and integrity have passed all these laws in secret and done all this in, in hiding. And once this comes out and it gets ruled as unconstitutional, the whole house of cards falls. Even retroactive immunity falls and all those companies that are participating are liable for it. All the crimes they were committing. Which when Hayden got up there and said this is all legal, well then nobody really said, well why did you have to give retroactive immunity to all the telecoms for all the crimes they were committing? Well, it wasn't legal and it's not constitutional, it still isn't, in spite of the fact they tried it. We're now challenging the laws they passed to try to make it legal. That's unconstitutional, and no law can stand that's unconstitutional, and that's the hope we have. Um, and just one last thing before, because I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience, but there was, um, I'd just like you to explain, Jess, the, there was a, quite a bit in the film stressing the importance of um, describing um, Tom and John, etc., as whistleblowers as opposed to leakers. And I just wanted you to explain why uh, that is so important and what, the, what exactly the concept of whistleblowing means. I know it's, um, you said, you know, it has the connotations of s snitches, etc. I mean, I know in, in German, for example, there isn't actually a translation properly of the word. So can you just explain some of the issues around that in these cases? Sure. In most countries, there's not an actual word. And if there is a word for whistleblower, it's something derogatory like rat or snitch. Um, and there is a big difference between leaking and the people I represent, including Bill and Tom and Edward Snowden, all get accused of leaking. But Leaking is when you, for example, um, give some, the, out, the undercover identity of someone as political punishment to punish your enemy as Vice President Cheney and Scooter Libby did with Valerie Plame's name. As opposed to whistleblowing where you make a disclosure that you reasonably believe evidences fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, or dangers to public health and safety, and you do that in the public interest. So there's a big difference between leaking and whistleblowing, but the, the government, both the executive branch and the legislature, Congress, um, refer to any whistleblowing as leaking because of the pejorative connotations without stressing the difference. Um, and that's been part of the problem of the government also using the Espionage Act to go after whistleblowers. Um, it's a law that doesn't take into account what your motivation was, whether it was to sell information to our enemies for profit or whether it was to inform the public about secret information they should be, have been made aware of. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? I know we don't have long, but we can. Um, has someone got microphones? Is someone, there's a lady over there with a hat on. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful film and also for your testimonies. And I have a question for the people here, um, the former NSA employees. Uh, it's not clear from the film or from articles what the relation is between the NSA and the office of the vice president or the president, and could you explain a little bit about how that works, whether decisions were taken mostly by? Or you mean within? as in who they're accountable to and who's yeah. signing off on these programs? That exactly, are, what's yeah. the relation between those both well power yeah. structures, yeah. basically? <laughs> NSA is a military agency. It was not actually uh, created by Congress through legislation. It was signed 
into law by the stroke of a secret pen in 1952 by then President um, Truman. Um, it's, it's a Department of Defense. It's also part of what is referred to as the intelligence community. So you report up through what's now the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. That includes the CIA and the NSA and the other intelligence agencies of the United States. Uh, ultimately, uh, the Secretary of Defense you know, reports up through to the President. Um, during the Bush administration, Cheney essentially was uh, given the entire national security portfolio. But then, of course, where does it all ultimately uh, find itself? At the very, very apex uh, is the President of the United States. And under our Constitution, he's also the military commander in chief. And it's important to note, what I, given what I just said about NSA, what we're seeing, and it's continuing to expand itself, is the militarization of this entire space including the cyber and information space. The battlefield is, is the globe. The battlefield is everywhere and anywhere. And now internet is considered to be part of that battlefield. And so NSA, as long with a number of its other partners, wants to militarize that space. And under military, or I will actually use the word, under martial equivalent law, they believe they have broad purview given what they believe is the existential threat to command that space. And that's, I believe, is an extraordinary risk. The very system, ironically enough, called Internet, that was designed to get the message out in case the balloon went up, Neune Neusse Luftballon, that I remember hearing over and over again during the 1980s when I used to fly over here um, and spent a lot of time in Europe during that time. Uh, in a nuclear winter, when everything else, you blew out all of your com communication nodes, that was the only message you could get out. That was the original basis for internet. How, how I run now the government wants to take it back. They want to reown that whole space. And they're doing so in partnership with security services from the round, around the world, including the BND. I, I can only add to, to that, that uh, inside NSA, when this program first started, it was referred to as a Cheney blood oath. In other words, it was directed by, directly out of Cheney's office. Addington, his lawyer, and you in the OLC were the ones who tried to make it look legal in secret. As long as the papers were secret, it, it, secret, it looked pretty good. But otherwise, when they've come out, they looked like they're... They're, con they're concocting their own laws and making their own rules and deciding what is and isn't constitutional. And, and well, wherever. The, yeah, the, okay, the gentleman down the front. Thanks a lot. I ask myself, uh, if, I think a lot of us have now in the last four years, uh, been watching videos of your speeches, of uh, videos online, so, so we have to look a bit of CNN, we have to pro probably read WikiLeaks, and then The Guardian, and then we watch uh, Chaos Computer Congress videos of you, and, and so, so this is sort of the assemblage of the live stream of what is happening, which means that we, we depend on a sort of non-journalistic, non-filtered, live video, live movies of what you got, of what you, what you can say now, of what you understood yesterday also. Yeah? So, so in a set of social cybernetic information analysis, it's quite in interesting how those who are interested, and probably most of you are if you're here, and you uh, try to assemble the, what is the state of the union, <laughs> what is the state of situations. And now the normal thing would be that we as, you know, old time 20th century citizens, we would depend on the journalists. And obviously the journalists are a profession that in Europe and the United States are also very much uh, self-molding, the, the sculpturing where to go. Sorry, just because we don't have much time, yes. do you have a question? The question or? is, Sorry. What, what is, what is the, the self-modulation of journalism that also on the backstage you are experiencing? How do journalists, you, you're interviewed a lot, you're journalists yourself, what, what, uh, how is it happening there? Uh, uh, 
WikiLeaks started as a secure Dropbox and a, and a secure publishing, online publishing. So I just wanted to ask you about the state of journalism now in 2015 and, and what do you think about that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the things that I kind of discovered in, in making the film. In terms of mainstream journalism, uh, certainly in the United States, um, it's kind of a very double-edged uh, thing and you see it play out in two different ways in, in the film. Uh, on the one hand, in the case of Tom Drake, um, the, the article by Jane Mayer in The New Yorker, uh, and and the uh, interview on 60 Minutes, which came roughly in the same week, uh, was an example of, of journalists really doing their job and looking at what was going on critically and uh, really changed the equation uh, for for Tom's case and, and really and actually was one of the things that brought the whole subject to my, uh, into my field of view as well. Um, on the other hand, there's an awful lot of stenography going on. There's an awful lot of... Um, framing of these issues in a way that are really um, kind of acquiesced to the, to the existing power uh, structures that sort of um, almost reflexively see things from the government's point of view. And of course the example of that is that interview, that, that last interview that John Kiriakou did on the Today Show in, in which the interviewer, who actually is a former prosecutor herself, essentially lays out the government's case all over again and asks him this sort of prosecutorial line of questioning. Um, you know, to my mind, I, I just was almost shocked by that, uh, maybe perhaps a little bit naively, but um, to me it was, um, it was almost the opposite of what journalism is supposed to do, which is to ask the hard questions of those in power uh, instead of doing their, their job or kind of echoing their, the, their job for them. So it, it, it plays out in both ways, but uh, um, unfortunately I think the larger trend overall um, is that mainstream media in particular is, has been very um, supportive of these policies, kind of um, gives the government the benefit of the doubt. Um, as uh, as Jesslyn points out in the film, uses uh, uh, official leaks uh, to write stories all the time that are favorable uh, to the government's perspective, um, and then the government turns around and and uh, accuses people they don't like of leaking and and uses that as a, pr a pretext for prosecution. So. Um, it's also why I look to WikiLeaks as the prime example of the new media modalities, frankly. Um, any more over this side, the lady there? Um, yes, my name is Elsa Rosbach. Uh, all of this began, as you emphasize, after 9-11, under the U.S. legal theory of the war against terror which allows the U.S. supposedly not only to investigate all U.S. citizens, but to go in any country of the world, take out terrorists, etc. And Europe has uh, remained very ambivalent about this. Uh, Europe has, and even the United Nations have not fully accepted the legal theory, the quasi-legal theory of the war against terror. They still supposedly believe in sovereignty. They believe in data protection. Uh, one very striking example even is that the European Parliament voted over 500 to 47 on a resolution in February 2014 saying that no European country may assist with drone strikes, whether through intelligence or through using Rammstein or whatever. Now you all, many of you, have been in Europe many times. You've gone to the people in the Bundestag, you've gone to the European Parliament, you've testified. I'd like to know whether you see any hope uh, that Europe will lean against the U.S., that Europe will stop this. Of course, something like Charlie Hebdo falls right into their hands. Now all the European leaders with Netanyahu are clearly whatever. But I'm asking whether you see any hope over here. Does anyone have a particularly European... I mean, I... Whilst I appreciate what you're saying, my personal perspective of that would be that, that Europe will, when it feels it has the bit of leeway, will sort of make a farce of pretending to stand up for various things. But you can see precisely where Europe lies in incidents like Morales' plane being downed. 
So Europe quite happily at the behest of the US government was happy to close airspace for a presidential plane. So I think my perspective at least is that the reality of European politics is that they will just roll over for the US. Um, does anybody have anything different to that? I, or? I, I just wanted to add one <laughs> little point. Uh, 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 while, while the president are w over in our country, uh, several presidents have called this a war, uh, legally it's not a war. The, con the only one that in our, in our government, the only org body that can declare war is Congress, and Congress has not declared war. That's why President Bush dropped the uh, claim that he had War Powers Act, that he had war powers, uh, because he doesn't have a war. That's not been declared. I mean, he's declared it, but he has no right to. The Congress is the only body that can declare war in the United States. Hope is not a strategy, by the way. Um, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't think there was hope, but it, it really plays itself out on the ground. And we can't forget, one of the critical things here is, in many respects, the security services are holding their own political systems hostage in, with regards to existential threats and, quote unquote, the security of the nation. And history is not kind, but that's my greatest concern, is some of the security services and knowing that the, there's this huge shadow of the United States as it continues to cast itself across mo most of Western Europe in particular, is that those security services believe there really is no sovereignty. They operate in a space, in a modality where no sovereignty exists, and they can cross any border, any barrier, or any law at will. And I think that's, that really is, or we're gonna end up with sort of some kind of gated democracies or some sort of protected enclaves, well, that tends, that tends to locate itself with the elite and those who are in charge and those who have control. That's my bigger concern in terms of the relationships that you're speaking about. And I think that's, that is the real tension uh, within the European theater is what do you do about your security services when, when they're the ones that are holding secrets, where they're the ones that are holding such extraordinary information, and most, uh, more, more frequently than not, they're in direct partnership with other security services, including those of the United States. Jess, you want to say yeah, uh, While I very much appreciate the Bundestag investigating BND and its cooperation with the NSA, I mean, our own Congress in the United States has had no investigation. This morning, uh, I mean, we, a bunch of us have testified to the European Parliament. This morning, I testified to the Council of Europe about John Kiriakou's case. So I very much appreciate that Europe um, is willing to at least take a look at this stuff, but in terms of anything actually happening, they still completely have cooperative agree agreements with the United States and willingly, routinely, daily, bow to the wishes of the US and the majority of the world's communications are still routed through the US. Any other questions? There's loads of, oh. Hi, thank you. Um, any comments on maybe a forecast for 2015 about after the Barrett Brown uh, very harsh sentencing and the Jeffrey Sterling conviction, and of course your um, Google um, gag order there, um, and the chillings effect already being felt also in the hacktivist community saying, oh, we're not going to report on this anymore because I have kids and I'm afraid. I'm just quoting Quinn Norton recently talking about that, which is actually very disconcerting in, in these um, circles that are mostly very um, sympathetic and uh, willing to support these causes. Um, any forecast for this year and the chances of appeal and how do you think the, the judicial court system, is there anything left to salvage? Thank you. You want to go from the judicial? Um, you know, things were already quite chilly um, without the events of the last two weeks with Barrett Brown's sentencing and with the conviction of Jeffrey Sterling. But now this puts us in a deep freeze, both um, whistleblowers and hacktivists and journalists. And I think part of this is an overall, looking at it more broadly, is a war on information by the government. And while I believe both Jeffrey Sterling and Barrett Brown have appealable issues um, and there will be appeals, um, it, it looks pretty bleak right now and people need to wake up fast. I mean, one thing I would add to that is that um, if you look at, so for example, um, 
if we look at the history of whistleblowers in the US, I mean, uh, as you see in the film, Tom's life was basically destroyed. Uh, Manning got 35 years in prison, and yet we still had Snowden. Um, so I would say that there is actually um, a bit of hope in that sort of example, that as bleak as things look, it does show that if we do stand together, if we do stay strong, if we do show these people that there, are, there is a community willing to accept them and stand up and fight for them, then we will get another Snowden. The, fundam the fundamental issues raised by Edward Snowden, which did ignite a debate that did not ignite based on the disclosure that Bill and myself and others made, um, I think is crucial as it comes down to we the people, and he's left it. Edward Snowden himself has said that, is that it, it's up to us, and what we, do with what, this, what we do with this information. If the public is informed about it, then they can take action, and that part of that action is going back to those who represent you in var various parliaments uh, within, within Europe. The one thing I am encouraged by is that the level of debate, the level of discussion, the level of discourse that's taking, pla taking place in most of Western Europe is far more sophisticated than what's taking place in the United States. That to me is encouraging because at least people are talking about it and not just in five second sound bites. No, I, I, I just wanted to respond briefly to that idea of the chilling effect. I mean, in some ways, people like me, documentary filmmakers, um, sometimes were on the front lines in terms of doing investigative work. But this piece I did really wasn't investigative in tone. It was more of a, of a you know, a, a personal journey and looking at the experience of these people. Uh, however, still, I mean, I, I can just say that the that the, the, these, the examples that are getting made of the whistleblowers and other people like, like Barrett Brown is getting into the consciousness of, of people. I get, can't tell you how many friends have come up to me and said, hey, you know, be careful, what, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, just be careful, you know, uh, there's just this sense of fear almost that I, I could somehow get in trouble now just for doing my job, for, for making, movies. Um, that's sort of, I just can't imagine that even 10 years ago, people saying stuff like that. So there is this, um, I sense, I think, getting out there in the general population that, you know, it's dangerous to ask questions. I mean, I think in that, that in itself says a lot about the effect this kind of uh, really campaign has had. And um, it really is extraordinary when you look at the number of all of these cases that have happened under Barack Obama, who, who pledged exactly the opposite um, during his his first um, campaign for the uh, for the presidency. Christopher, you want to? Yeah, is it? It's on. So I, I'd uh, like to invite myself to ask a final question because we have to ra <laughs> wrap up or I'll kindly invite then Sarah to, to, say you're in to, charge to, to, <laughs> to wrap up after my question. I want to ask something that mirrors the discussion about what you think about the state of these questions here in Europe. But the question is, what do you actually bring back with you uh, when you go back to the United States from these visits to Berlin and to other places in, in Europe and the world, given that it's global struggle and problem that, that we're discussing here, although a lot of it is fought also in the US. And that's a question to all of you in the panel. Yeah, I mean, the three of you have been... Well, I personally, uh, every time I come over here, I get reinvigorated because people over here uh, have, a, in Germany especially, have a living memory of the Stasi and they know or have a much better idea of what's going on and what it really means ultimately than we in the United States do. I mean, after all, we haven't had anything, any, any dictator over our way for about 300, uh, 240 years. We're not classified as George such the, anyway. George the Third. <laughs> well, until we got George the W. Yes, okay. We traded him for George the Third. So, uh, but uh, we don't have, you know, it's like we have uh, this long period here where, where we've been depending on our, our country to do the right thing under the founding principles of our government. I mean, that's, uh, and we're used to that. We've been conditioned that way. It's like Pavlov's dogs. We expect uh, to be treated uh, no, matter what the, no matter what happens in the future, that our government will continue with the values they've had all along when, in fact, they've been radically changed. 
I mean, now we believe, now our policy is torture, rendition, you know, for torture or murder or, I mean, uh, droning people, I mean, uh, and spying on everybody. I mean, it's a direct violation of all the founding principles that we have as a country. So uh, coming over here, I get reinvigorated to go back and keep up the fight, you know. So that's what I'm doing, and I try to do that publicly in my country as best I can. I echo exactly what Bill just said. In fact, I realize being over here how much safer and more relaxed I feel doing my job as an attorney compared to um, doing so within the United States. And um, that's something I have to bear in mind that I feel safer um, being in Europe than I do operating in the US. I guess. Uh I would follow up uh, with the same thing. You know, I think it's important to note that the first real funding for this movie uh, came from Germany. Um, ZDF uh, uh, was one of the first uh, people to get behind the film. They were the first to broadcast it um, uh, back in December. Um, we we premiered in, uh, in Europe in Amsterdam and uh, in November and the the response there was just phenomenal. Um, I mean, really, um, one of the most amazing screening experiences I've ever had with that audience. Um, so um, very definitely feel inspired uh, by the citizens in Europe who really uh, care about this issue. Um, you know, it's like Tom said, th this, this crosses all boundaries of, of nations and territory. Um, that's what the people behind these policies are doing. But on the flip side, you know, we're all in this together too. So maybe it doesn't really make that much of a difference whether you're in Germany or, or the Netherlands or in the United States, um, as long as people are, are understanding what, what these issues mean, what these policies mean. So. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very encouraged by, um, by coming to Europe and seeing that there's real engagement um, with this. And I think that can help inspire um, people in America, too. There was a time a few hundred years ago that my relatives on both sides of the family used to live in Europe and went to the United States to seek life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and escape tyranny and escape a lot of oppression. And I've, it's, it's quite something for me, it's even poignant, that every time I come back to Europe, I am frequently approached and asked, why don't you come live here with us? And you know, I, I do pause, because the, audience, the, the audiences we have had here have been far more welcoming and far, far more inviting um, than the audiences that we typically have in the United States. Um, I don't feel like an enemy when I'm over here in Europe. So. I, I just want to thank you all for coming here and listening to us. We, a couple, we are extraordinarily fortunate. The three whistleblowers that are here on stage and extraordinary uh, courage of, of Sarah Harrison, who actually leads the Courage Foundation, um, and rescuing uh, Ed Snowden from Hong Kong, right? We are at least not in prison and we're not behind bars, okay? And that kind of, that freedom, the freedom to live, the freedom to exercise liberty, the freedom to have a voice, the freedom to speak, I can't even begin to put words on that. And every day that goes by, and particularly since I've been on this trip, which has been an extended trip for us, in light of the invitations and Bill's award uh, this year as a recipient of the Sam Adams uh, Associates Integrity Intelligence uh, Award uh, means more to me now than ever. Every time I wake up and I'm you know, pinching myself waking up in the morning, wow, I'm still free. I can actually get up and have breakfast and I can come to this wonderful facility and I get to share with others who are also like-minded and realize what, what the risks are. And you can never take liberty and freedom for granted. And that's why I've dedicated the rest of my life and the words that you saw in this documentary where John was actually in one of the monuments 
the Lincoln, right? And in, in the Jefferson Memorial, some of these truths are self-evident. Those inalienable rights, well, I've dedicated the rest of my life to defending life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not just for U.S. citizens, but for citizens across the world. Um, so I think that's basically all we've got time for. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. James, it's a great film. Tom, Jess, and Bill, as heroic and wonderful as always. And just at the end, as Tom said, let's just remember those that not only can't be on stage but couldn't even Skype in that have lost their voice at the moment. So Chelsea Manning, Jeremy Hammond, Barrett Brown, the list goes on. <laughs>